Hello everyone and welcome to Luminar Coffee Break. I'm Angela Andrew and today I'm joined by special guest Darlene Hildebrandt. She is a, an amazing travel photographer, has many years of photography experience and is a great photography teacher and she's going to be talking to us about contrast. So let me go ahead and pull her up on the split screen here. There we go. Hey Darlene, how's it going? Hi hey Angela, I'm doing good. You? Yeah? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for joining me today. So do you want to tell folks a little bit about what you're going to be talking about? And then I will switch the screen over to you and give you the floor. Today, we're going to be talking about contrast and tonal control. And that includes, if we, we have time for two examples, we'll do one where we're actually boosting the contrast and one where we're lowering it or removing spots that are bright so that your eye goes to the subject. So contrast and tonal control today. Excellent. Well, let me go ahead and share your screen. You can go ahead and... Uh, take the floor and I'll monitor the chat and let you know if there's any questions. I uh, just want to quickly say right. welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, Hi. and I <laughs> saw that we have somebody joining us from Chile. Um, Herman Rodriguez, bienvenidos. Um, so can everybody see my picture on the screen? It should be a nice mossy temple from uh, Japan. If yep. you can see that, then we're gonna get started. Okay, so this one, this is my after image. So I wanted to show you what I've done to this image to boost it. So what I really wanted to show here and feature was this carving and this moss or this green stuff growing on the side of this temple. So the before image was this one. So it was a little bit lackluster. It was an overcast, very cloudy, dull day. Um, and I wanted to really punch it up and focus my attention on that center um, beam there. So I did a bunch of tonal control. So I'm actually going to start just by undoing everything and going back to the original and show you what I did here. All right. So the first thing I did was I, I adjusted my composition. I usually do this first and I use the perspective adjustment because my I could see that the columns were a little bit tilted. And I think I cropped in a tiny little bit tighter because I wanted to come in to the edge of that right about there. So something like that was my first crop. Uh, and see, I missed this little spot on the side. So I want to crop only a, a little bit to get rid of some of these problem areas, but not too far, just like that. You know, I'm doing that first because anything that I do with regard to tone control, if I'm cropping it out later, there's no point of me having it in the picture, right? I also warmed this image up a little bit. So we're going to warm it up with some light. And you can adjust your contrast in several different ways, okay? When you're working in the light panel, you've got smart contrast, which I'm just gonna take it all the way up to a high number so you can see what it's doing. And look what's happened to the color. So when you increase the contrast, you automatically increase the saturation. So I find that a lot of people jump to the saturation slider because they want more color and punch out of the image. But if you simply start with increasing the contrast, specifically blacks, okay, I'm going to show you that next one, you'll get more saturation automatically, right? I've got the histogram turned on here. If you want to know how to see that in Luminar, you just go to view histogram. And now with the latest update, when you change images, it will stay on the screen for you. Okay, so I'm going to do the next method of adjusting contrast that I use a lot, and that is using the white and the black sliders, okay? And I'm gonna show you a little trick here. If you turn on the clipping warnings, okay, so that's J on your keyboard, okay, and I'm gonna show, take it up to extremes, you'll get anything that's clipping on the white end or the top end of the histogram showing up in red, and anything clipping in the dark end showing up as blue, okay? So what, what I wanna do when I'm using that, when I'm dragging the white slider to the right, so I wanna drag it up so I start to see some of this clipping and then bring it back down until I don't have the clipping. So what that's done is it's adjusted the histogram to the right so that I'm touching the edge but not going off the graph, okay? So now I have pure white in this image. Then I'm gonna do the same with the black, but on the black end, I actually do wanna clip a little bit because when you have the blacks clipped, it goes back to what I said earlier about increasing that contrast and the saturation. So let's take a look at the before and after, and all I've done really is crop it and adjust the whites and the blacks and it's already punchier. 
any questions about that so far? Because I'm going to show one more. Right, uh, the Lofkin, next one. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, Wolfgang says, is it that easy? I couldn't see it, my bad. So do you want to do the before and after once more? Sure, let's do it this way so that you can do the side by side. Is that easier to see? Yep. So, so see how this one is really flat looking, right? And the colors, the green itself is not real punchy. Like, especially when I put it here, look at the greens here versus the greens here, right? So you get much punchier contrast when you increase the whites and the black, specifically black, right? Another way to adjust the contrast is using curves. And this is something that is confusing to a lot of people, okay? So when you open this in the, in the light panel, you actually see a representation of the histogram in the background here as well. And it's called curves, but it's confusing because it's actually a straight line. So what it's representing is black on the left, white on the right, just like the histogram. Okay, so when you increase the curvature of this line, so I'm gonna do that on purpose to make it look more like an S, okay? So if you've ever heard the term S curve, okay, that's what it's referring to is it's a steeper curve here on this curves tool and look at what happened to the contrast. Now it's really, really punchy, okay? If I go in the opposite direction and basically make an upside down S curve, I'm decreasing the contrast or flattening it, okay? So in this case, I don't want to play with the curves because I've already done the adjustment I wanted with the black and the white, okay? So let's move on to some local controls because all of the things I've done so far are what's called global edits and they apply to the entire image, okay? You cannot mask the light tool, but you can mask some of the others, okay? So the next one I want to do is structure. So structure is great because it boosts kind of the overall contrast and um, let's call it sort of grunginess of like the edge tones, right? Similar to what you might find as clarity in Lightroom or Photoshop. So I'm going to take it to an extreme and I'll show you why I do that. I want to be able to see where what it's doing and where because I'm going to mask this one, okay? So I want it to just apply to this middle area. So I'm going to use a mask and I'm gonna use, in this case, a radial mask, okay? So gradient mask only applies from the edge in, and I wanna get this middle part, okay? So this was actually a question that I had the other day on one of my lives. Um, so if you wanna join me for uh, additional, I do this basically every week on my YouTube channel. So I edit live user um, submitted images. My fans submit their images. So what I'm doing is now I've applied this mask, let me hit the forward slash key. Okay, so where you see the red is where it's applying, but I want it opposite. So I'm gonna go up here and invert it. Okay, so now I've got it applying to this part here where you see the red and see what it's doing is it's punching up this area again. So I don't wanna punch up the outer areas. I want the eye and the viewer's eye coming into this middle part. Okay, so I'm happy with my mask now I'm just gonna dial the amount down. So often what I'll do is I'll go to real extremes with my tools so that I can see where I'm masking it and then dial it back to something sort of where I want it to be. And I do the same thing with the vignette tool. So vignette tool is great for controlling the darkening of the edges, which I wanna do here, okay? Very specifically this bottom part. So I'm gonna take it really dark I'm gonna take the feather way down low to zero. So what that does is it makes it a hard edge and I can see the shape of the vignette. So then I can adjust the size, the roundness of it. Let's say I want it more narrow. Okay. And I want it to apply to this same sort of area. So I'm now going to choose the subject and move the vignette around a little bit. Okay, so I want this bottom area, bottom and left area to be darkened and not so much over on the right. Okay, so I'm happy with the shape and the positioning. Now I'm just going to put the feather back to zero and I can just double click it and then bring the amount up a little bit so it's a bit gentler. Okay, so you want your vignette, you don't want something that looks like this, okay? So you don't wanna see the vignette you want it to be subtle and have a very nice softly faded edge, okay? So toggling this one off, you can see what it's doing is it's just producing the effect I wanted, which is drawing the eye into the center.
maybe even a little darker. Does that make sense? Another final method that I used on this one was the dodge and burn tool because I wanted to get really specific and darken this area, right? So I'm gonna show you two different ways that I can darken specific areas around the image. So I can use the dodge and burn tool set to darken. And what I do is I dial my strength down to about 10, between 10 and 15, because I want to paint it in gradually. It's like if you're painting a wall in your house or a fence or something, you don't dip the brush into the paint and get a big glob and then smack it on. You paint layer by layer, okay? So you layer on the same way here. Now, I don't know, can you guys see my cursor with the circles? Or do you just see like... The you see the circles? Awesome. Okay, so when I, I'm using the square bracket keys to make it larger, I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. And you'll notice that there isn't a feather or fade um, slider for the dodge and burn tool. But the trick is if you hold shift and go up and down with these square bracket keys, so I'm going left, left square bracket, right square back bracket, I can affect the feather of this brush, right? So I can make it fade softer or have a more hard edge brush. So now I'm just going to paint in these bright areas some little bit of darkening, okay? I'm gonna change the size of my brush so I'm just getting the parts that I want up in here. So anything that I find that's drawing attention away from my main subject, like this little bit on the right, I'm just gonna darken these with the dodging and burning tool, right? So let's see what that's doing, turning it off. Can anybody see that? Watch when I turn it on, okay? And it's just darkening those specific areas, okay? So I'm actually gonna turn it off and show you the other method that you can use. And that is the local masking tool. So right on the right-hand side, there's tools and then local masking. You can add a basic one. So it's kind of like a layer. And then you get all of these tools that are similar to what we see in the light panel, okay? So now I can lower my exposure, I can lower the highlights, and I can paint it in where I want it, okay? So I'm gonna mask this in just to the parts that I want to affect and darken. So you can see me painting, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see me painting with this brush and I'm doing a fairly large brush and a very quick job here, okay? just to demonstrate for you, right? So now I'm doing the same kind of thing that I did with the dodge and burn tool, but I have more controls here, okay? So I can darken the highlights, I can lower the contrast, or I can even lower the saturation so that I really focus in on that center area again. So in this case, I think that this is working more effectively than dodge and burn. And I just apply it and I can go back to my main tools for more editing. So let's take another quick look at the before and after, right? Any questions? None in the chat right now, but I just wanna remind everybody that if you have questions for Darlene, please be sure to put those into the chat. We'll do our best to answer them for you live. If you end up watching this as a recording later on, you can put them in the comments and we'll make sure we get those answered after the fact, so, all right. So I'm gonna apply one more tool here. I'm going to go back to structure because I want this mask that I created and I'm gonna copy it. Okay, so I open the mask tool and then just choose copy because I wanna apply something else just to that same area, but I've already done one mask so I don't have to recreate it. So I wanna use the dramatic tool under creative, okay? Because this one is great for punching up contrast as well. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna take it up to an extreme so you can see where it's applying. Then I'm going to open the mask tool and paste. Right? And you'll see what happens is now it's just applied to this middle area again. Right? So I've used that same mask. Now I'm just going to adjust it how I want it. I'm gonna keep the saturation about like that. Now if I wanted to alter the mask, I could go back in here and paint it in or out, okay? So if I wanna to add to the mask, I could just add it in this area up here and make sure I get this whole section, like so. So all of the things that you're doing inside of Luminar, these are all non-destructive edits, which is great. I can go back anytime into the history and go back in the history to a previous state 
or I can undo it by going back to original, which is what I did at the beginning, right? I finished up this image using a mood or a lot just to give it a bit more of a sort of an antique faded look. But let's switch over and do one that has too much contrast and see how we can do some tone control. This image here of this winery. So anytime you're shooting something like this, this is a blue hour or nighttime shot when you have city lights like this or lights um, and the dark areas, you're going to get a lot of contrast. Okay. So you could also bracket this image. So I did shoot bracketed images and I've done a version of this in Aurora HDR and it does a great job as well. But from one single raw file, you want to make sure that you're shooting raw if at all possible, because you're going to get a lot more data that you can pull out of a raw file than a JPEG. Okay. So this is the before image. You can see where I'm looking here. I'll just come in a little bit a little bit closer. So where I'm looking is for particularly the contrast in this sign and look at the vines on the side of the winery. It's super dark. So after I've done my tone control, I brought out the leaves in the on the wall and some of the detail on this sign. Right. So let's see how I've done that. Now, instead of undoing this one, I'm just going to go through and show you the tools that I used and what they're doing. So the beautiful thing in Luminar AI is that it shows you with this little dot next to each tool, which one has been used. Okay. So if I want to see what it's doing, I can just open it, toggle it on and off and see what that tool is doing. And you could do the same thing if you've applied a template to one of your images. This is a great way to learn. You can apply a template and then go and see what that template has done and sort of deconstruct it that way, right? So what the accent has done is it's actually picked up a lot of the dark areas that I wanted to brighten and the sky enhancer has darkened the sky down a little bit. You have to be really careful. So when I remember I mentioned on the earlier one where I'm increasing the contrast that you end up with stuff that's oversaturated, okay? So you have to be careful not to go too far. So that's what Enhance has done. In the light panel, I've lowered the highlights. Mostly you can see that I've lowered the highlights and done a color correction here. And I've also lowered the, his, uh, the curves layer. You can see where I've done here, this cur curves tool. I've pulled down the highlights and the shadows. And that's really affecting these areas that I wanted to uh, uh, in the sign here. Tone control with color in the HSL panel is great because you can affect the luminance or brightness of individual colors, right? So opening up the color panel, make sure you have this bottom part, HSL opened, and go to luminance, okay? You can then affect individual colors. So you can see here that I've got blue affected, right? And when you pull these sliders, anything that is that tone in your image will be darkened or brightened. You can see that I went, I pulled the magenta down and that's affecting the colors a little bit in the sky. Okay, purple. So you can see there's a fair bit of purple in the sky, which you might not expect. Okay, and the same applies with foliage. If you want to, for example, brighten this wall, you would think that it's got a lot of green in it, but you can see that it's actually probably more yellow. Okay. And that's really common with grass. So if you want to brighten or darken grass or leaves, make sure you try green and yellow, right? So just with the HSL panel, okay, see what that's doing is it's affecting some of the tones. Another one that I used here is the super contrast, okay? Super contrast allows you to affect highlights, midtones, and shadows separately. And I use this one on highlight control a lot. Okay, so I'm just gonna undo it and show you what it's what's what it's affecting. Again, what I do is take the highlight contrast slider fairly high to see what it's doing. So you can see that it's really affecting the sign here. And then I'm gonna apply the balance to the right so you can see that it darkens to the right and lightens to the left. So I definitely want to darken my highlights. Okay, now see what's happening is the sky is really great with this tool. The sign, not so much. And over on this side of the building, also not so much. So if I turn that off, you can see that it's doing 
nice things to the sky, not so nice on the building. So once again, I can do a mask and just erase it this time from these areas. Okay, so I don't want this tool applying to these areas because it's made them sort of muddy and overly saturated, okay? Just like that. So let's do a before and after again. And I also did a dodge and burn on this one as well, right? So I did a little bit of darkening in the um, parking lot area here with the dodge tool. And I also did a lightening in this area of the trees. So I'm gonna zoom in here. Let me zoom in to about 50%. Okay, so you can see these vines here. So in this case, I'm actually going to lighten, right? And I'll show you why I use the, the strength of this tool down to about 15%. Because if I go at 100%, um, you get sort of something that's really obvious looking. Okay, that's actually not bad in this case. But if I wanted to, let's say I do it up here, okay? You get this really obvious looking sort of burned bit, right? So you want to layer it in, right? So I'm gonna lower my strength back down here and I'm just gonna layer in. And I'm just looking to pick up detail here. I'm not looking for full um, you know, shadow reveals, just a little bit of detail so that you can see it's fines. That's all, right? How are we doing, Angela? Doing good. A um, couple of comments here. Um, Levan says, I really appreciate the workflow that's used. Most of the tools are easy, but what to use and when isn't always well explained. So thanks for that. And Ryan says, great to have your tips available to us newbies. Awesome. Um, so just on my screen now is my website and my YouTube channel. So if you want to join me on Saturdays, um, I do this for an hour to two hours every Saturday and you can submit your images. So I'd love to edit your image and you can get an idea of um, it's great for beginners that don't have any idea how to start. So exactly that, Brian. Awesome. Well, did you have any other images to show us or should we wrap it up for today? Yeah, I could do another one. Sure, we can do one more. Okay. Um, this is a fun one in terms of, um, actually I'll do this one here because I showed this one on the coffee break for insiders. And this is something that works really well when you have um, a foggy or a hazy image like this, okay? So this one here, did I go back to, okay, I'm gonna go back to the original. And it was a really super foggy day. Um, I think my husband Rob is watching. This was shot in um, Colombia. And um, this is the cathedral where Pablo Escobar was, was, quote, in jail, right? And it was super foggy. We're up in like the rainforest. So you, when you get these kinds of conditions, your contrast goes way down, okay? So the fog, or if you have haze, or even if you're in an area of great smog or smoke, right? So to increase that, all of the things that I did earlier will work, okay? So increasing the blacks, okay? So I'm gonna hit that J key again, right? So you can see that even increasing the blacks, I'm still not hitting the edge of that histogram, okay? So if I wanna go farther, I can take the edge of the curves layer. Actually, I'm gonna undo this. You see the graph here in the background? You can actually see the histogram really good in the back of the curves. So what I want to do in order to get black is take this little dot here and match it up with the data on the edge of the graph. And you can see the farther I go, I can start to get clipping, okay? So just touching the edge of the graph there, and I might play around with a little bit of both, okay? Then I'm gonna do the same with the whites, I'm just gonna pinch it in a little bit. And now you can see that I'm starting to get clipping up in the sky and you can adjust that with the highlights if you don't want to clip that, okay? So highlight slider will bring that back. And the other thing I'm gonna do is a little bit of smart contrast. So I'm kind of doing a combination of everything and I often call um, photo editing is like a dance. So you do one slider and you do another, or it's like a teeter-totter. And then I have to go back to highlights to keep that highlight up here, right? So I'm increasing contrast, but then I wanna pull that highlight back to keep the detail here, okay? Even though there's probably not much detail in the fog. Another one that's really helpful for this type of 
of issue is under the landscape tool and that is dehaze okay so dehaze will allow you to do exactly that look at what happens and you see this background image start to sort of appear right and this one is great because if i want to keep the haze on these palm trees but not on the foreground right i can apply this only to the foreground and this time I can use a gradient mask. So now I'm just going to pull the gradient mask up. So it's applying to the wall, okay? Remember wherever you see the red, that's where your tool is applying. Wherever you don't see the red, it's not applying. Okay, so I've applied a gradient mask. So this one now is only applying to the bottom half of the image, right? Let's do it before and after. Okay, so I've still kept that hazy feeling by leaving the smog or the smoke in the background, but the foreground I've pulled out with the black sliders, the contrast, and the dehaze. So that's a little trick, and that works really well whenever you have a flat image. Excellent. Well, let me go ahead and switch back here to our side-by-side -side view if you want to change your camera angle there. I can do. <laughs> Just have to find myself. Where am I? I'm lost. <laughs> Oops, there we go. Sorry, my mouse went went crazy on me. There it, there I am. <laughs> well, thank you so much for those great examples of awesome pictures and fantastic techniques. It looks like the audience enjoyed them. If you guys like this show and you're enjoying the Coffee Break series, make sure you give us a thumbs up here on YouTube. Um, our producers love to see that, and that keeps the show going. So much appreciated for all those thumbs up. We appreciate having each one of you here with us every day. And thank you so much to Darlene for joining me. Darlene, where can people find you? I know you mentioned a couple of things earlier, but where's the best place for people to find you if they want more from, from you? You can find me right there. That's my website, digitalphotomentor.com, or you can join me on YouTube. Um, I would love if people want to comment on below the video as well. If they want me to do more tutorials, what topics do you want me to teach? Excellent. Well, with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for joining us. Tomorrow is our weekly wrap up episode. So you'll have Vanelli and I both will be going back over the topics that we discussed earlier in the week. So I hope you'll join us tomorrow and I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Bye everyone.